So hello everyone, welcome to our first science lecture. Um, my name is Sarah Welsh. I am the assistant director here at the Community Boating Center. Um, thank you all so much for joining us. We are so excited to have Dr. James Simon here today um, to talk to us about using DNA to inform conservation of marine species. I'm just gonna do a brief introduction for um, Jay and then we'll go ahead and get started. But um, Jay earned his Bachelor's of Science in Natural Resources from the University of Vermont in 2002, followed by an MS in Biology at the University of Rhode Island, studying the ecology of symbiosis in temperate corals in 2006. He worked as a biological collector at the Marine Bio Biological Laboratory in Woods Hole, Massachusetts from 2005 to 2007, then took a year-long backpacking trip around the world. I want to hear more about that, too. <laughs> a position as a researcher studying symbiosis and sea anemones at Western Shannon Point Marine Center brought him to Washington in 2008. He began his PhD at the UW School of Aquatic and Fishery Sciences in 2014, focusing on epigenetic processes in coral reefs and sea anemones. As a postdoc with Puget Sound Restoration Fund from 2019 to 2012, he worked on conservation genetics of basket cockles and pinto abalone. Since 2019, he has served as a capstone coordinator and research assistant professor for the new marine and coastal science program at Western Washington University. Thank you so much, Jay. Um, I'm so excited to hear your talk. Hey, thanks so much for that intro, Sarah. That was great. Um, <clears throat> and thanks everybody for um, joining this um, session. Um, so <clears throat> without further ado here, I will um, get going. This picture, by the way, I took in um, uh, Saudi Arabia, which was a, a fun little quasi research trip I took a few years ago. Um, so that's that's the Red Sea there. Um, let's see, let's advance my slide here. So um, when we're, when we're talking about marine conservation, um, so this this figure just shows sort of the relative pressure that we've been putting on marine life since the industrial revolution started in you know around the mid 1800s, and so uh, just basically just shows that you know we're we're doing less hunting of marine species than we used to. We're you know obviously only a few countries are still whaling, so. In terms of hunting, you know, we're we're putting less pressure on uh, marine species, but we're still doing a lot of fishing. So fishing pressure is still very high. Uh, deforestation pressure is still very high, and of course that leads to runoff that affects the oceans. Um, we're still experiencing plenty of uh, habitat loss in the oceans, and then at the those bottom bars, they're just showing that we have more recent. Um, effects in the oceans, uh, pollution and climate change. And these are, these are these new stressors that are affecting marine species. So um, by and large, um, you know, we have, we're putting quite a lot of um, pressure on marine species. And so um, there's a real need for conservation, you know, uh, uh, across the board, but I'm gonna focus on, on my work with marine species. Um, and so as sobering as the conservation issues are, uh, it's actually also sort of an exciting time to be a, uh, a marine biologist like me who is a molecular biologist. And so, um, you know, we've had these tremendous uh, technological advances in computing power. So the top left there shows um, what we call Moore's law, basically the number of transistors on microchips has been doubling every two years. Um, and then in the upper right, the cost of DNA sequencing has uh, dropped tremendously since, um, you know, in about the past 15 years or so. And so, for example, you know, like the Human Genome Project that was completed about 20 years ago, that took uh, a really long period of time and, and a lot, a lot of money. If we were to do that today, it would be a fraction of the cost and time to do. And we have all these new DNA sequencing technologies like Oxford Nanopore and Illumina, uh, PacBio. So we have uh, this huge growth in the, <clears throat> excuse me, the um, basically the industry that supports 
uh, biomedical research and um, uh, other kinds of biological science that has really in increased our capacity to sequence genomes and, and understand genetics and, um, and other aspects of, of molecular biology. Uh, and it's hard to overstate how much the things have changed. I, I was in college 20 years ago. Um, you know, the, none of this was possible. And so one of the, one of the motivating factors for me in going back to school, to get my PhD was to, um, kind of get into this kind of stuff and really, uh, uh, learn genomics, <clears throat> excuse me. And so, <clears throat> so how can we use DNA to inform uh, conservation? I uh, just want to touch on a few things here. I'm sure I won't hit all, all the important ones. Uh, well, I, hopefully I'll hit most of the important ones, but I'm sure I'll miss a few. Um, but kind of the first category would be genetics and genomics. And when we talk about genomics, we're really just talking about um, increasing the scale of genetics to looking at uh, whole genomes or at least parts of whole genomes, whereas genetics, we're usually just talking about a handful of different genes or genetic markers. Um, so we can use genetics and genomics to help define species that might be hard to define uh, just by their appearance, it's what we'd say is like their morphology. So some species are um, notoriously difficult to identify and, and to understand uh, species boundaries. So we can use genetics to help tease that out. Uh, also, when we're talking about within a single species, different subpopulations, uh, we can look at their connectivity, how well, how well they are uh, mig migrating between populations and, and <clears throat> their diversity. Um, and then we can also look at environmental or human-caused drivers of natural selection. And uh, also best practices for captive breeding programs. And that's particularly important for species that have been brought down to such low levels that uh, we, we decide to intervene and um, uh, do captive breeding. And so uh, understanding the underlying, underlying genetics of species that we're gonna be captive breeding is really important. So we don't um, do anything, uh, you know, basically we, we don't wanna harm the, the natural, the wild genetic integrity of those species. And then we have another category, uh, environmental DNA. And so this is a, another relatively new field where we're suddenly realizing that <clears throat> DNA is, is ubiquitous in the environment. You know, it's it's not only is it found in organisms and microorganisms that microorganisms that live in the water and in the soil, but even organisms that are large uh, leave behind their DNA in the water and the soil. So, uh, through excrement and um, you know, some species produce lots of mucus and slough off skin that leaves behind DNA in the environment, and so we can use that DNA <clears throat> for things like uh, finding rare or invasive species. Uh, we can also use it to do biodiversity assessments. We can, we can now take samples of water and figure out which species are living in an environment without having to go trawling or, uh, or even scuba diving to go and see who's living there. Um, and we can also do things like diet studies where we can take the excrement of one organism and see uh, the kinds of species that it's eating based on the DNA and its excrement. And um, then we have forensic DNA analysis. Uh, and that's basically just using DNA to identify products that might come from endangered or protected wildlife that then we can use to um, uh, maybe prosecute poachers or things like that. And then um, last but not least, there's a relatively new field as well of epigenetics and um, Epigenetics is is, an, is a really kind of interesting and, and a bit harder to understand. And it's this sort of information that's layered on top of the genome. And we can use epigenetics to understand things like environmental memory and acclimatization. And so, for example, we know that um, the environment can, can influence our genomes. We know that uh, throughout the course of our lives, the actual sequences of our genomes don't really change. 
But then there's this additional information layered on top of our genomes, and that's epigenetics. And that can be affected by the environment. You know, humans, for example, um, people who smoke uh, or people who have had uh, traumatic experiences, that influences their genome through epigenetics. And it also influences, you know, every other organism you could imagine. Um, and I'll be talking about corals and how coral, uh, you know, when we think of climate change and how it affects corals, um, you know, climate change can be causing epigenetic changes in corals. And an intriguing thing about this that we're really just starting to understand is that these epigenetic factors can potentially be passed on to subsequent generations. And that's this really cool idea that acquired, um, uh, basically acquired uh, changes can be passed on, you know, things, changes that an organism experiences in the course of its life can actually be passed on to its offspring, which is, <clears throat> uh, you know, we always think of Charles Darwin's ideas of natural selection as driving evolution. Uh, but there was a, a researcher um, before Darwin, Jean Baptiste Lamarck, who thought that acquired changes could be passed on. And that was tucked away for many years. And now we're revisiting it and realizing that Lamarck was actually potentially right about some of that stuff. And so these are the, uh, the themes that I'm going to focus on in the talk um, defining species, population connectivity within a species. Um, best practices for captive breeding programs, uh, uh, rare species detection, and also the uh, environmental memory and acclimatization. So um, <clears throat> these are all things that I've uh, been doing over the past couple of years, and I'm gonna give you some examples. So just to go over the, the <clears throat> genetics versus epigenetics again, what I mentioned is that when we talk about genetics, we're talking about differences in the actual uh, sequences of the DNA code. And so, most of you probably know that uh, the DNA code is made up of four letters. And uh, if there's a change in one of those letters, that's a genetic change. Whereas when we're talking about epigenetics, there's no change in those letters. But what we can have are things that are layered on top of the genome. In this case, I'm going to be talking about something called DNA methylation. And that's when you have this um, CH3 as a methyl group attached to one of, the, one of the DNA bases. And so those can be ephemeral. And they can um, they can persist for long periods of time, but they can also go away. And so those are uh, these epigenetic effects that I was talking about. And if we think about our genomes as like uh, big books, and the and the pages in the book uh, as sort of like our our individual genes, um, then epigenetic factors can be thought of as sort of sort of like bookmarks that are marking genes of interest. Um, so that's probably the, the simplest way to think of epigenetics is just sort of these bookmarks on our genes. So um, this is one of the projects I did for my dissertation. And I worked on corals in Belize. And um, I was interested in, in whether coral epigenomes could be responsive to environmental change. And I worked on this coral <clears throat> called Paredes astroides. It's an Atlantic species or Caribbean species, uh, very common on Caribbean reefs. And I did my work at this place called Caribou Key Field Station, which is a Smithsonian station. And it's a beautiful spot. It's uh, right on the Lee's Barrier Reef. <clears throat> it's about a three quarter acre island. So a tiny little island. And it's just a great natural laboratory for um, doing the kind of work that, that I wanted to do. And so what I did uh, for this experiment was I collected a bunch of these Paredes corals. Um, I took a fragment and I, um, I collected fragments from uh, quite a wide range uh, from the rain station, about a 20 kilometer range. And I brought them all back to this uh, common garden. We call it a common garden experiment where we bring individuals to a common environment and so I brought all these coral fragments from different areas into the back reef here at Kerry uh field station. And so this is the back reef. Here's the fore reef where the, the waves are breaking. And the back reef is a shallow area. And here I am in the back reef gluing 
uh, coral fragments onto the substrate. And so what I wanted to do was um, put these, these corals from different areas and different habitats into a common environment for a year and see how their epigenome changed. And so I sequenced the DNA before and after at the end of the experiment. What I found was that the, the basically the differences in the, the epigenetic differences between the colonies, the coral colonies, uh, they were lower after a year in the, in the common garden envir environment <clears throat> than when they started. So here, 2015, when the experiment started, they had a relatively high difference in their um, methylation. And then when I collected them a year later, after they'd spent a year in the same environment, their epigenetic uh, profiles were much more similar, suggesting that they had sort of converged on a similar, a more similar uh, epigenetic state. And I also had control fragments that I left in their original habitat and compared them to the transplant ones. And again, the transplanted ones had a lower uh, difference, again, suggesting that this common environment, uh, experiencing this common environment made their epigenetic profiles more similar. And so what does this mean? So this means that um, this is sort of a mechanism for that environmental memory that I talked about. and. Um, we think that this idea of an environmental memory may be able to be used uh, when we're doing things like restoring coral reefs and we're uh, breeding corals for restoration. If we can uh, potentially do something called preconditioning, where we expose those corals to uh, relatively short periods of, say, uh, somewhat stressful temperatures, it might prime them and create a memory for them that allows them to withstand those high temperatures later almost a little bit analogous to um, getting a vaccine and being exposed to a pathogen. You, you develop some resistance. So that's, um, that's sort of the idea with this experiment that I did. But we're really just in the very early stages of understanding how epigenetics influences um, uh, environmental memories. So changing gears now, I wanna talk about a different story here, a uh, different thing that I did during my dissertation work and that, that's this idea of species delimitation that I talked about uh, in the introductory slide, you know, basically defining species that are really hard to, uh, to, to identify and, and um, just by their appearance, they can be very um, uh, challenging to, to identify. And so these are three corals also in the genus Parietes. Remember the, the one I talked about before as a, a Parietes coral. These are these are different species and they're, they're branching species. And they've been recognized as different species for a long time. So in the parentheses here, these are, these are naturalists that lived you know, over 200 years ago that described these species. <clears throat> and so these, these have been recognized as different species for a very long time. This one, Parietes parietes, has relatively thick branches, whereas uh, Parietes furcata here, has uh, median branches, and then Parietes divericata has these thin branches. Um, so these differences have been recognized for a long time, but then, you know, maybe 40 years ago or 50 years ago, people started doing uh, genetic studies, and, <clears throat> and they said, well, these corals actually aren't that really genetically different. So maybe they're just different, what we'd say, uh, morphotypes or different um, phenotypes different, you know, basically just um, different corals appearing different, but actually being the same species. And so I wanted to get at this with more powerful modern genomic techniques. And so I, um, I collected corals from a variety of habitats, a variety of depths, different branch diameters, and I, I sequenced their genomes. And I actually found that they had pretty clear genetic differences. And there were these three very obvious groups. So here's um, one group here in this plot. Here's another group and another group here. This graph is just showing that uh, three groups uh, has the lowest statistical number, which means it's the most likely. And then this is another plot just showing how those two, or sorry, three different groups. Uh, if we look at their <clears throat> genetics, um, uh, or genomics, I should say, all the thousands of different genetic markers that I looked at, this is how they look. 
and not only that, but the um, they differed in their branch diameter. So particularly this group two had um, much thicker branches than the other two. And so we see that uh, these there are these genetic differences that are very obvious, and they do seem to be related to branch diameter, which takes us back to 200 years ago when these, these um, naturalists first described these species. And so basically this study that I did shows that modern genomics suggests suggest that these are indeed separate species. And so it just shows the power of looking at many, many more um, genes basically in the genome than just a few, which is what we could do only maybe even 20 years ago, we couldn't look at that many genetic markers, but now we can look at thousands. So I'm gonna change gears yet again and bring us back up to the Northwest and um, talk about some more recent projects that I've been doing. And so this is, uh, these are uh, slalom people uh, in the mid 19th century uh, harvesting shellfish, uh, I think near Squim Bay. And so, you know, shellfish are an extremely important part of Coast Salish uh, culture. And uh, they're really, really important food. And uh, Coast Salish people still today harvest uh, shellfish for subsistence. And um, so it remains a very important part of their culture even today. Uh, but unfortunately, we've, we've seen some declines in, in several shellfish species. So like uh, Olympia oysters have declined uh, quite a bit, uh, pinto abalone, native little neck clams. Uh, so those are kind of three species that are, have really experienced severe declines. And then we have another species uh, which is the basket cockle, uh, Clanicardia nutalii. And um, if you've ever walked on a beach, you probably picked up one of their shells, very common uh, clam. These are also uh, a favorite, favorite food of Coast Salish people. And they're doing well in some places, but not so well in others. Um, and we don't really know why. But <clears throat> some, some tribes uh, on their usual and accustomed harvest areas the beaches that they harvest at. Some tribes are having a really hard time finding them, uh, even though on some beaches they're doing okay. And so some tribes have floated the idea of maybe doing a stock enhancement um, uh, <clears throat> effort basically to breed them in captivity and see beaches with um, captive bred individuals. Uh, <clears throat> so what we wanted to do with this study was understand the population connectivity of cockles and basically understand their genetics better to help inform any potential uh, restoration or enhancement strategies. Because um, captive breeding is a, is a tricky thing. You don't want to go into it uh, blind uh, because you can do harm to the, to the national, uh, natural genetic integrity of a species if you don't understand it. And so um, we collected cockles on a number of beaches in Puget Sound and in the Salish Sea and also uh, out here in Willapa Bay. <clears throat> we brought them back to the lab um, and this is us uh, collecting at night. We did most of the collecting uh, in 2019 and early 2020 in the fall and winter when you have low tides at night. And uh, we brought back the, the uh, cockles into the lab and we dissected tissue. We, we were looking at a number of things as well. Aside from genetics, we were also looking at something called um, clam cancer. And um, that's another story, maybe for another time. But um, for the genetic study, <clears throat> we found basically that there are two very distinct uh, groups. And one of them were, one of them was the, the outer coast Willapa Bay cockles. They were very different from the all the cockles in the Salish Sea. Um, but, uh, and so if we think about why that might be, uh, this is a model showing basically how surface water flows out of the Salish Sea. Um, so those are particle tracks that are modeled showing how water, uh, basically of constant water, uh, surface water exiting the Salish Sea, because what we have uh, is called estuarine circulation where we have deep inflow of oceanic water due to upwelling. And uh, we have uh, fresher water that's flowing out. 
And so that's estuarine circulation. And so that process uh, makes it very hard for, um, if you think about how clams are produced, they, they, produce, uh, they, uh, they produce larvae that live in the water column for up to 10 days or so at a time. And so if you're a larval clam or cockle floating at or near the surface, it's gonna be very hard for you to get inside the Salish Sea. Um, so that's why we see this, very likely why we see this pattern of, of all the Salish Sea cockles being very different from the ones on the outer coast. We also saw a very subtle difference between hood canal cockles and the ones uh, in other sub-basins in Puget Sound and, and, and Salish Sea. So there's a very slight difference between Hood Canal. And again, we think that's because of uh, oceanographic factors, uh, namely the fact that Hood Canal has a uh, what we call a sill, basically a very shallow area close to the entrance to Hood Canal that uh, impedes deep water movement. And then you also have the Hood Canal floating bridge that actually has a draft of about three and a half meters and that impedes surface water movement. So that's one of the reasons why Hood, Hood Canal might have uh, slightly different uh, genetic uh, uh, differences than uh, other cockles. Now I wanna, I wanna talk about something called effective population size. <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> and so when, we're, when we usually talk about a population, <clears throat> most of us think about the census size of the population, which is just the total number of individuals in that population. Uh, <clears throat> but with genetic data, we can look at something called effective population size, uh, which relates to the genetic diversity of the population. So to illustrate this, I have two populations here. The one um, on the left here is very diverse. I'm using color here to represent their, <clears throat> their, their genetics, basically their genotypes. Um, but obviously co cockles don't have these crazy colors. I'm just using it uh, to illustrate it. And so this population here is very diverse. Whereas this population over here has a, a couple individuals that are very closely related. And so this population here has a very low effective population size relative to this one. And so what this means, um, <clears throat> this is very important when we're thinking about uh, potentially doing a stock enhancement project, because um, as soon as we start breeding individuals in the lab, we're gonna take a very small number of individuals as parents because there's only so many individuals that we can, we can breed in a lab at one time. It's very hard to replicate what mother nature actually does um, where there's you know, thousands to millions of individuals reproducing. Uh, so when we do captive breeding, we are in effect um, creating a population with a very low effective population size. If we produce enough of those individuals, they can then drive down the effective population size of the wild individuals. So um, we need to be very careful when, uh, particularly when the effective population size of the, the population that we want to restore is very high in the wild. Um, and we also have to pay very close attention to the number of, of broodstock, the number of parents that we're using to breed those individuals. And so based on this, we found actually very high effective population size in the cockles. And so we developed some, some potential strategies that, uh, that could be used to, to augment the cockle populations. The first strategy that we came up with that was probably the best strategy is um, actually translocating cockles that grow <clears throat> naturally inside gooey duck culture tubes. So that for those of you who don't know what a gooey duck is, a gooey duck is a very large uh, clam that's marketed uh, largely to the Asian market. They're very valuable. Um, there's a wild fishery, but we also have um, uh, numerous shellfish farms throughout Puget Sound that farm them and they grow them in these tubes. Um, it turns out that cockles love to settle inside of these tubes as, as larvae and they grow up to adulthood inside these tubes. And they're a nuisance to shellfish growers. Um, but they could be a potential boon to uh, tribes that are interested in subsistence harvest. And so we found that these uh, cockles growing in these tubes, very similar. I mean, they're basically wild cockles. They're identical to the ones growing on the beaches. So this, from a genetic standpoint, would actually be the less 
or the least risky way to enhance the cockle populations because you'd be taking wild cockles and just translocating them to beaches where uh, <clears throat> tribal members could harvest them. Another strategy uh, could be to do something called sea ranching, where we actually produce cockles in, in, uh, in a laboratory through captive breeding, <clears throat> put them out on beaches, but then um, the strategy would be to harvest the cockles before they are at reproductive size. And so that way you could limit their reproductive influence on the wild population. So that, that was strategy number two. And then the third one would be like a full on stock enhancement program where you're doing uh, captive breeding, um, seeding beaches, and then harvesting the cockles at, at whatever size you want. That way um, you would have cockles, but you could harvest cockles whenever you want, but you'd potentially have them interbreeding with the wild individuals and potentially drawing down the effective population size. So, you know, these are hard questions. They're gonna become potentially more prominent as we experience more uh, shellfish die-offs. Um, maybe some of you remember, there was a, a widespread die-off in the, in the middle of the summer last year. Uh, where we had a heat wave uh, coincide with some of the lowest tides of the year. And that killed many, many cockles and other shellfish. So this is in the aftermath of that. So, you know, when we see these warming events, um, they, they could become more common in the future. They likely will. So we may be um, confronting the need to consider uh, stock enhancement uh, in these kinds of species increasingly in the future. And that's sort of a segue into this next species I'm going to talk about where we've already reached that point where we are uh, doing active uh, restoration stock enhancement. And this is the Pinto abalone, Haliotis Kamchatkana. This is our only local abalone species. It ranges from uh, Baja, California to up to um, uh, Alaska. And uh, these used to be pretty pretty abundant in our local waters, but now they're, they're quite rare. And about, um, well, I don't wanna get ahead of myself here. So basically here's a, here's a graph showing the density of abalone uh, <clears throat> starting in uh, the late, or excuse me, the early nineties and going to 2018. So um, the state, um, and, and other fisheries managers started noticing uh, cockles, uh, sorry, cockles and uh, uh, abalone starting to decline, uh, you know, in the 80s. I mean, I think as early as this, the late 70s, they were, they were already noticing declines. Um, <clears throat> so they implemented a fisheries ban in 1994. And in spite of that ban, the population kept declining. And so, um, that suggested that uh, there was basically reproductive failure going on in these populations. You can also see that here. <clears throat> this graph is showing the size distribution of abalone. Uh, here's in the uh, late 70s, early 80s, you had relatively large abalone. Uh, excuse me, you had, you had a wide range of abalone uh, sizes. And then as we get progressively, um, Further into the, uh, the 90s uh, and the 2000s, the sizes of the abalone get larger. And so what, what's that show, what that is showing is that abalone are basically aging out of the population and there's no uh, juveniles uh, coming in. There's no small ones replacing them. So these two uh, graphs together basically show us that abalone aren't reproducing naturally. And so, um, why is that? Well, abalone have, uh, you know, their, their particular um, reproductive mode involves being close together. They don't copulate, but they have to be relatively close together in order to uh, effectively fertilize uh, their eggs. And so abalone are separate sexes, male and female. Um, they release eggs and sperm into the water column, but in order for the sperm to fertilize the eggs, uh, a male has to be close to a female. 
And so if you if the densities get too low, that's just it's not going to happen because they're not going to be close enough uh, to each other to have successful fertilization. <clears throat> and so uh, in other abalone, we know that sort of the minimum density of abalone that you need to have successful reproduction is about 0.3 abalone per square meter. And we can see that already in the uh, by the early 90s, the, the abalone densities were already lower than that. Excuse me. <clears throat> so in response to this, um, Puget Sound Restoration Fund teamed up with uh, a number of partners, uh, NOAA and WDFW, about uh, 15 years ago, and a little more than 15 years ago, and decided to look into potentially starting a restoration aquaculture program. And so they started breeding abalone, outplanting them onto uh, natural reefs and assessing their survival. And so uh, here's a, a male abalone spawning in the lab. And so this involves you know, collecting abalone sperm, mixing it with eggs, uh, growing juveniles in tanks. And then the, the juveniles are, um, they're taken out into the wild in these tubes. Excuse me. And then the, the tubes are put onto the reef and they're, um, uh, you know, we put rocks on top of them to keep them from moving around. And then here are all the juvenile abalone that, that eventually crawl out of the tubes onto the reef. And then every year, these outplant sites are surveyed to see how the abalone are doing. And so um, this study that, that I helped with was basically just asking the question, how effective is the restoration program from a genomic perspective? You know, is it... Um, are we, are we producing genetically diverse individuals? Um, what is the uh, uh, likelihood of, of inbreeding at these restoration sites? Uh, things like that. And so um, I don't wanna get too into the weeds of this figure here. Um, this is basically just showing uh, <clears throat> a value called FST, which is basically just genetic differentiation with higher numbers, meaning uh, great, greater differentiation. But what I want you to notice here at the top um, with this um, <clears throat> dendrogram here in the source, uh, whether it's hatchery or wild. So hatchery is in the light blue color and then wild abalone are in this uh, pink color here. And so what we see is here, there's a cluster of abalone from the hatchery. And these are all the, the uh, abalone from the older outplant sites that were outplanted <clears throat> between about 2009 and 2017. And then there's a separate cluster here with wild abalone from the San Juan Islands, uh, wild abalone from Ketchikan, Alaska, and then wild abalone also from the San Juan Islands that served as broodstock for these abalone here. And then um, notice though that we have a hatchery group here in blue. And these are individuals that were bred most recently in the hatchery between 2017 and 2020. And so this is kind of, um, you know, a good sign here because it suggests that even though these, these hatchery bred abalone that uh, are living at the outplant sites right now, they're quite different from the, the wild abalone. These more recently produced hatchery abalone are actually more similar. And we think that what's going on here is that there's two things. The older abalone that were, <clears throat> that were outplanted um, in the early stages of the, of the program, um, when you have um, many, many of those abalone didn't make it, there's only about 10% survival over the long term. And so when you have a lot of uh, mortality, something called genetic drift happens where you have the random loss of um, uh, genotypes in the wild. And so just that random mortality draws down the genetic diversity. Meanwhile, uh, more recently, they've increased the number of broodstock in the, in the program. And um, they have been producing larger numbers of families. And so that's, I think, two reasons why we see these more recently produced abalone. Uh, showing more, um, it looks like more genetic diversity and more importantly, they're more similar to the wild abalone. 
on a, a, a genetically speaking anyway. Uh, something similar here, this is looking at allelic richness, basically the number of different genetic variants in the populations. And what I want you to notice here is that um, these lower bars here, these are all the hatchery bred abalone, the older ones at the <clears throat> older uh, outplant sites. And the, these are the wild ones up here. So the wild abalone have higher uh, genetic diversity, but then in the middle are these, um, <clears throat> again, these, uh, these abalone bred in the hatchery more recently, they kind of, they're right in the middle here. So they have higher genetic diversity than the, the older outplants, which is a good sign. And then we can also look at um, the uh, likelihood of uh, potential mate matings <clears throat> at the outplant sites. So this is looking at relate, relatedness among all these different groups and the proportion of potential matings between <clears throat> unrelated individuals in this blue color and half siblings in this um, sort of um, blue green and then full siblings in green. And so what we see <clears throat> at the older outplant sites, there is some potential for inbreeding between um, full siblings or half siblings uh, but by and large, any potential matings would happen between unrelated individuals, which is good. Um, compare that to the wild individuals, and uh, there's vir virtually no um, potential for inbreeding. So what we want to see is something more like uh, what we see in the wild individuals in happening at the outplant sites. And again, the good news is, is that the more recently produced abalone have very low relatedness and very low potential to be uh, um, inbreeding. Back to effective population size. We also looked at populations, uh, effective population size. If you'll recall when I talked about it earlier for the cockles. Um, and what we found is that the, <clears throat> the effective population size of the abalone at the outplant sites, relatively low. Um, some of the wild abalone had <clears throat> infinite estimates of effective population size, which is somewhat inconclusive, but it basically just means it's really large. And if you recall what I said with the cockles, when you have really high effective population sizes in the wild, you have to be careful because you could potentially draw down the, <clears throat> those high effective population sizes with your hatchery bred individuals um, if they represent a large proportion of the total population. So our conclusion with this study was basically that um, you know these these more recent individuals are showing. Uh, higher gene genetic diversity. The program is definitely capable of producing pretty um, uh, genetically diverse abalone, but the broodstock sizes are really important. It's going to be very important for the program <clears throat> to prioritize using as many individuals to serve as parents for these, uh, <clears throat> these hatchery bred individuals to avoid drawing down the natural genetic diversity. And so that's, again, <clears throat> sort of another segue into this, this last piece I'm going to talk about, which is, um, you know, how do we find abalone? These, these individuals are so rare, um, <clears throat> you know, on a, on a given dive survey, um, it's, very, it's very hard to find them. You know, it's very, it's very uncommon to see a wild, wild abalone <clears throat> in our local waters anymore. So dive surveys are really the critical way that we find abalone for the breeding program. Um, but uh, we were interested in maybe looking at other tools to try to find abalone. And um, I talked earlier about environmental DNA at the very beginning, basically using DNA that we find in the environment in a water sample to try to locate um, a rare organism. And so um, this work uh, basically just asks the question, can we use environmental DNA or eDNA to detect pinto abalone? And so to do this, uh, I first tested the method in the tanks at the hatchery where, where the, the um, uh, abalone, the juvenile abalone are held for the, uh, the restoration program. And I developed a genetic marker uh, to basically take a seawater sample and do uh, quantitative PCR, very similar to what's done for a COVID-19 test, basically 
looking for uh, a very uh, small amount of DNA in a sample. So um, basically taking that water sample, filtering it down and um, looking, uh, extracting the DNA and then testing to see if there's abalone DNA in there. And what, what I found the method actually works really well. It's related to the, the biomass of abalone in the tanks. So this just shows the, um, this is the number of copies, gene copies of this particular abalone uh, gene. And it's positive, positive, positively related to the biomass in the tanks. So that suggests that, that you know, as we would expect, there's more abalone DNA when there's more abalone in, in, the, uh, in the water. But this is a closed system, right? It's not a closed system. There's, it's a flow through system, but it's a fairly concentrated system. How would this work in the wild where abalone are much more uh, diffuse in the water? So I tested this in the field, and this is me taking a water sample uh, very close to an abalone aggregation in the field at one of the outplant sites. Um, here's, here's our dive team after a really long dive, doing a, a field survey along with some water sampling. And what I found with this is that um, I only detected abalone eDNA uh, very close to the bottom. Um, in no cases did I detect it on the surface. So that basically informed my approach for the, the rest of the study. So I only took bottom samples for the rest of the study. And last summer I worked with a student uh, from Seattle University uh, named Ryder Gathright. And here's Ryder taking a bottom sample uh, this past summer with a uh, something called a Niskin bottle. And uh, you send a Niskin bottle down and the bottle's open and when you hit the bottom or just above the bottom, there's actually a lead weight just below the bottle that tells you when you're on the bottom. And um, when you find the bottom, you send down a, a, a weight that then triggers the bottle to close. And so that's how you can take a bottle um, at depth. And so we then took those uh, water samples and filtered them right on the boat on a filter paper and then brought them back to the lab and extracted the DNA. And uh, one of the things that we did was to test the probability of eDNA detection. And we used the outplant sites that have known abalone biomass on them from the dive surface. And we found this nice positive relationship between um, abalone biomass at these restoration sites and the uh, eDNA detection probability up to about um, almost 80% probability of detection at the highest um, uh, densities of abalone. But what this shows is that um, the, the method is not foolproof. If there, are, if there are abalone down on the bottom, you don't have a 100% chance of detecting their DNA, um, particularly if the density is low. In this, you know, for example, here, you only have a 30% or uh, 35% uh, chance of detecting abalone DNA when the biomass is low. So the method, um, <clears throat> uh, it, it seems to, to work reasonably well, um, but it's not, it's not perfect. But it, the, actually the dive surveys are not perfect either because abalone hide really well. And so it turns out that um, uh, you know, eDNA uh, surveys may be almost as effective as, as visual diver surveys. What we also did was we, we tested as many different sites as we could around the Salish Sea. We did six boat trips uh, over the course of uh, the summer. We used um, these habitat maps to locate potential abalone habitat and also aerial photos of, of kelp beds to select places to do our sampling. And these are all the sites that we sampled. And uh, we, we got positive detections at about 13% uh, of the sites, mostly in the, in the Western Strait and in the San Juan Islands. Um, so we can use these sites where we had abalone DNA detections to potentially go to later and do dive surveys and hopefully find abalone that can serve as broodstock for the restoration program. Um, and maybe even use this, this technique as a tool to monitor the um, outplant sites. And um, uh, what I'm doing, um, in the near future is uh, a range-wide genetic study of pinto abalone. So 
Uh, say at some point we need to bring in abalone uh, for the restoration program to serve as broodstock from outside the state. Uh, this will inform where we should be getting them from. Should we get abalone from uh, Alaska or further south? Uh, which 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 abalone are going to be most closely related to to our abalone in, in the Salish Sea? Um, and so that's um, that's something on the horizon that I'm I'm working on. And that is everything. Um, so I'm going to end there. And um, these are all the funding sources that have supported these various projects, um, various collaborators, and and many many others who've helped. Um, so, um, and thank you all for, for listening and I, I apologize for, for losing my voice. Thank you so much, Jay. That was absolutely fascinating and just makes me so excited for our upcoming partnership with our science internship. So thank you so much. Yeah, my pleasure. And I'm sorry about your throat. <laughs> yeah, I'm sorry too, man. I hope it wasn't too distracting. Not at all. Um, we do have a couple of questions. Um, no, I see Jamie has a few of them as well as Michael. Um, Jamie or Michael, if you guys want to um, unmute, you can go ahead and ask your questions. Um, I'm going to go ahead and ask. There you go. Um, go ahead, Michael. Okay, yeah. Um yeah, I just wasn't quite clear on the on the terms high and low uh, as they related to uh, the what you said was the effective population size, but I think you kind of explained it again later. So if I understand correctly, that a high a high effective population or yeah high effective population size means basically that it's more diverse. Is that essentially? Yeah, that was yeah. the one. The picture on the left was the high. That had the the cockle shells that were all yeah yeah did did I did I mess that up did I say that the, no, no, uh, not necessarily I just wasn't sure I mean high and oh, low okay. yeah because so, population size I mean it's the same size right but it's it's a density thing right? or a, a diversity thing exactly yeah okay yeah so so yeah. high high population effective high high effective population density. Uh, I'm sorry. I keep, yeah, I just, I, just and I should have said, I should have pointed out, you know, these populations um, have the same census size, the same right. numbers, but this one has a higher effective population size. And yes, it, it, that's exactly what it is. It's just, you know, genetic diversity and relatedness. Okay, great. Thank you. Yeah. Perfect. And it looks like Jamie says that his computer, I'm going to go ahead and ask the question for him. Um, I apologize, it looks like my internet's unstable too, but um, in an earlier graph, when you had the um, comparison between 2015 and 2016, there was- Oh, go back. Yeah, there was a p-value of less than 0 0.001, um, and the uh -huh. error bars were super wide, and he just wanted clarification on the interpretation of that exactly. Oh, yeah. Uh, well, these are, so these are 95% confidence intervals. <clears throat> so um, <clears throat> you have all kinds of different error bars, right? And um, so, yeah, those are, those are, and these are also box plots. Uh, <clears throat> so these are, um, these are actually not 95% confidence intervals. These are the inner quartile range, <clears throat> excuse me. So the, um, yeah, the, you know, sometimes you can look at error bars and uh, yeah, if these were 95% confidence intervals, um, <clears throat> yes, that, that would suggest that they are not significantly different, but these are uh, box plots showing the, the interquartile ranges. So yeah, they, uh, they are in fact significantly different. Perfect. And Jamie had another question regarding um, where you're able, where are you able to do your DNA sequencing and PCR testing? Is it here in Bellingham or do you have to send your samples elsewhere? Uh, both, um, all of the above. Uh, <clears throat> so I'm best at Shannon Point Marine Center in Anacortes. Uh, we do have a molecular lab there. Um, we, we, uh, we have a, a, a sequencer there. Um, but it's actually not very high throughput. throughput. So um, all of the, the genotyping work that I've done has been um, 
sending samples to a different facility for the sequencing. Um, <clears throat> and there's there's various um, you know steps in the process. Uh, there's also a, prep, a step called library preparation. But that's actually the, the main step. And um, sometimes I've done that myself. Sometimes I've outsourced it. Um, and then for QPCR, we have a QPR, QPCR machine at Shannon Point that, that I used for the, um, the eDNA work. So yeah, kind of just uh, all over the place. Awesome. And actually I was just down <clears throat> at the University of Washington um, last week and this week doing something called uh, digital droplet PCR, which is this new PCR technology that's really cool. Um, so uh, yeah, I just, you know, I, I go where the technology is. Understood. Um, and I wanted to share, I know we have a couple people that came in a little bit later in the presentation. So um, a really exciting program that we're doing this year at the Community Voting Center is we're going to be having an environmental science internship focusing on bioluminescence and studying the different species that we have here in Bellingham Bay. Um, they'll be going out on a lot of our tours and sharing information in the public and doing a lot of different research programs. Jay, do you have any other information you kind of want to share about that? Like, will they be doing some of this DNA testing at all or the eDNA or anything like that, do you think? Well, so that's going to be up to, um, I'm not the faculty advisor for that project. Mm -hmm. um, that'll be Robin Codner. She's a, a researcher, a professor in environmental science. And um, she's going to be advising that project. And so it's kind of uh, up to what she and the intern decide to do. Um, but we have, we've talked about it and um, you know, we've talked about maybe doing a study where we look at uh, expression of luciferase, which is the actual <clears throat> uh, molecule that's produced that, that is the bioluminescent molecule. So we could actually um, look at production of luciferase in the environment over time using qPCR. So yeah, maybe. Very cool. Well, thank you so much. And um, I believe I believe we don't have any more questions for right now. I am going to send, um, you know, doing these science lectures is something that I'm really excited about. I'd like to do this as a continuing project and hopefully soon we can do them in person again. Um, but, you know, we're constantly developing what we're doing here at the Boating Center. Oh, we have one more question. <laughs> But we do, we are constantly involving what we're doing here at the Boating Center. And if this is something you're interested in, or if you have um, a direction you'd like us to go, please feel free to send me an email, sarah at boatingcenter.org. Um, and we're really excited. Michael, go ahead and unmute. What's your last question? All right. Thanks. Um, yeah, I, when, talking about the abalone and the decline of the abalone, it uh, um, occurred to me what what is, I mean, you, you said that they, uh, they put a, a ban on um, harvesting abalone like in the '90s, right? But what what other um, what other factors are involved in that? I mean, what are the natural predators for, for the abalone? Um, that's a good question. That's still um, a bit of a a bit of a black box at the moment. Um, so you know, when these abalone go out to the outplant sites. Um, the vast majority of them are 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 dead after you know within within a well we don't have an exact idea of the timing but the survival rate is is only about ten percent which probably is 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 normal in the natural environment you you know many of these marine invertebrates and fish produce you know huge quantities of eggs and larvae many of which get eaten. And so it's it's very hard to it, you know if you're a, a larval or juvenile anything it's you have an extremely low likelihood of survival, and so even getting ten percent um, is probably pretty good for some of these very small abalone surviving to adulthood. Um, but yeah, it's a it's a good question. Who, how are they, what are they dying of? Is there, are they um, are there environmental causes? Uh, is there starvation or is it just predation? 
And so WDFW puts out cameras, uh, time-lapse cameras. Um, I think, I'm not sure if they're like critter cams that are triggered by movement, um, but the past couple of years they've been putting out cameras right at the mouth of those tubes where the ab abalone crawl out to try to get an idea of what the predators are. Um, not that that would necessarily allow us to do anything. I don't know what that would, how that would necessarily help us because we're not going to be probably doing anything in the way of predator removal. Yeah, I mean, maybe, but um, but yeah, that's a good question. Um, but it just shows, I think, that um, once you bring a species down below its uh, reproductive densities, um, it's it can be very slow to return. You know, probably without human interve intervention, abalone could come back naturally, but it might take 100, 200 years. So certainly not within our lifetimes. And so um, that's why the state and um, others decided that it was, you know, worth the effort to intervene. Uh, yeah. So are you thinking that, that then that the overfishing or, or over harvesting is what initially caused the decline? To, to oh, start, absolutely. yeah. Okay. There's no question. Yeah, and it's been, you know, the the. Um, sorry if I didn't get your initial question, um, but um, you know, the same thing has happened to abalone in, in other parts of the world. California. Um, there's only really, I mean, virtually every California abalone species is in really poor shape, and it's it's all uh, related to overharvest and just this particular reproductive strategy that abalone have. Um, you know, they don't move very far. It's hard for them to find mates if they're not dense. Um, so they just have a particular reproductive strategy that makes them uh, very susceptible to um, declines when they're over harvested. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Because I mean, you would think, you know, when they get, they get uh, less abundant, then the food probably is not, uh, is less of an issue uh, for them. There's probably more food available, you would think, but then you know maybe right. stress also to being transplanted in the. Uh, okay, yeah, well that's that's, that's fascinating. Really, uh, thank you very much. Yeah, yeah, no, there's a lot going on, and and uh, there's actually a grad student at University of Washington right now who's trying to tease apart um, different factors that might be causing the um, differential survival, like. And it's also, you know, another interesting thing is how different survival is from one site to another. Mm -hmm. Some sites do really well and other sites, they all die. And mm -hmm. they can eat, they can be, you know, less than a mile apart, even less than half a mile apart. So we really have, we really don't have a good idea of why some sites are better than others. Is it some sites have more predators than others or who knows? Um, mm -hmm. But she's actually doing, she's got... Um, you know, all sorts of temperature and current loggers and uh, pH loggers, trying to see if the, it might be environmental factors. We've got the, the predation cameras. Um, so yeah, and, and I think she's doing a couple other things, but yeah, you know, there's active research trying to figure out how can we maximize survival of the, of the outplanted abalone. Yeah, yeah, great. Thank you, thank you for that. Yeah. We have another question. Um, how big are the abalone when they are transplanted? So um, that has varied. Um, you know, there, there's been research to try to figure out the optimal size for outplanting. And that's very, like, there was a, a grad student thesis at Western a few years ago that looked at um, actually just uh, taking out the larvae themselves uh, that are st still not um, settled. They're still swimming larvae and seeing how they do. If you just uh, uh, outplant them onto an enclosure, basically where you, you kind of keep them into a plot for a certain amount of time to give them enough time to settle and then remove the enclosure and see how they do. Um, and then, but basically most of the abalone that are outplanted currently are, <clears throat> they range from between one and two years of age. And so um, that would be about, um, you know, the size of a, between the size of a penny and the size of a quarter at, at the very most. Um, and so that seems to be kind of the optimal uh, trade-off between keeping them in the hatchery for a long period of time and 
make, and getting them up to a large enough size where they're not going to be picked off by every single predator there is. Um, <clears throat> and so, um, what was I going to say? Um, yeah, it, you don't want to keep them in the hatchery for too long because you know it costs money to maintain the hatchery. Number one, number two, you have something called artificial selection that can happen in a hatchery where uh, organisms that are raised in an artificial environment are actually not exposed to uh, natural selection. They're 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 um, you know they're, the the artificial environment does not make them. Uh, it's not selecting for the appropriate uh, individuals that will do well in the natural environment. So you want to, you don't want to keep them in, in the hatchery for too long, but you want to keep them in long enough so that they're big enough to avoid predators. Um, I have a question. Um, when I was in Santa Barbara, I was lucky enough to visit an abalone hatchery. Are there any in Washington that people can go visit or um, are they all pretty well protected? Uh, so, so Puget Sound Restoration Fund has the main hatchery at the Manchester facility in, in NOAA, which is like uh, extremely, NOAA has been like, particularly due to the pandemic has been very closed. Like, you know, I can't even go in there even though I have a government card uh, because they're restricting the numbers of people that can go in right now. They're still like, you know, very COVID restrictive. Uh, but even on a normal, you know, in a normal year, uh, it's not open to the public. There are satellite hatchery facilities now at, at the Seattle Aquarium cool. and the Port Townsend Marine Science Center, but I don't know if, if they're open to the public. Um, I'm guessing if any of them are, maybe the Port Townsend Marine Science Center, since that's sort of a small public aquarium. Okay, maybe the CDC needs one. <laughs> Yeah, no, I mean, I, I know we talked about that before and um, yeah, we should keep thinking about that. Uh, you know, there, this, the, the restoration program is, is trying to expand as much as possible and it's good to kind of not have all your eggs in one basket or not, not all your abalone in one basket because um, you can have catastrophic yeah. uh, failures at these, these facilities. Uh, for example, the Seattle Aquarium, I don't know if I'd call it a catastrophic, catastrophic failure, but virtually all of their abalone died. And it's probably just related to the fact that they uh, um, didn't have good temperature control of their tanks. And so they lost you know, thousands of juvenile abalone between the heating event last summer and the, the, the um, very cold weather we had just after Christmas. Because mm. abalone don't like fluctuations. And so they didn't have their temperatures dialed in. So it's good to have a range of hatchery facilities in case you have things like that where they're, they all die for some reason in one place. Um, Barbara has a, another question. She wants to know how old are abalone when they begin reproduction? Oh, good question. I'm not sure that I actually know that. Um, but I'm going to say, so they're probably reaching adult size. Their growth is actually really uh, variable. Like um, within a given year class, you can have huge ranges in, in growth rate. Um, but I would say probably your average abalone is reproductive at maybe six years old, seven years old, okay. which is relatively old for, for a mollusk. Um, you know, for example, cockles are reproductive at age two. Um, and I could be right, you know, it could be even later. It could be like 10 years. Very interesting. Well, Jade, thank you so much. This was absolutely fascinating. And I'm so excited to continue this partnership and um, really appreciate it. So thank you so much. That was wonderful. Yeah, my pleasure. Yeah, absolutely. Come, come paddle with us soon. <laughs> Yeah, no, I can't wait. Yeah, I can't wait to get out there. Perfect. Well, thank you so much, everybody. And we'll talk to you soon. Thanks, everybody.